church family, let's stand together and sing of God's grace. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. We sing of God's faithfulness, declaring his character as we worship him. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. been learning a new song over the last several weeks called The Cause of Christ. Christ we proclaim, He is the name above every name. That is what we're declaring together. Let's lift your voices and sing this. For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise. Sing that melody together. For the cause of Christ we go, with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see and many put their trust in the sun. Sing this out. Oh, uh -huh. 
join our hearts together in a word of prayer. King Jesus, that is our proclamation, that is our, the cry of our hearts this morning, that your name is above every name. Your name is above our names. Your name is above our church's name. Your name is above every name on this planet. Father, we are thankful that we get to join our voices together this morning with the saints around your throne saying, worthy is the Lamb. So God, we pray that you inhabit the praises of your people. God, we pray that you speak to us through Pastor Taylor in a few minutes as, as he brings us your message from your word. May it bear fruit in our lives. Father, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for friends and family that we can join together in worship. And thank you for the victory that is found only in the death and burial and resurrection, the work you've done through your son. And we ask all this and praise and study in his name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Welcome to Sugarland Baptist Church this morning. My name is Davey Gibson. I'm the education and discipleship pastor here at the church. And it is so important that you are here. At Sugarland Baptist Church, we proclaim that we choose community over isolation. And so whether you are worshiping with us right here in our worship center or you are worshiping with us online, it is important that you are with us today. You matter. Your presence matters. And we are so thankful that we can join together. God's word said that whether there's two or three gather, he is there in the midst of the gathering. And because of that, we have got way more than two or three in this room and way more than two or three online. He is here with us and we are thankful for that presence and your presence that allows us to, to gather together and proclaim the goodness of God. If you're one of our regulars, you're one of our members, we say a special welcome to you. But if you're one of our guests, if this is your first time worshiping with us or we have never received email contact or any kind of contact information, we invite you to take a connection card that's in the pew rack in front of you. We want to um, get this card from you so that we can reach out to you during the week. We have a gift for you. We'd like for you to place the card in the offering plate when it's passed later in the service or you can bring it to the Trinity Cafe immediately outside our worship center 
and we have a gift for you. We want to meet you. We want to greet you. We want to invite you to be a part of a Bible study and be a part of this church. And if you're worshiping with us online, you can text the number that's on the screen and a digital connection card will come right to your phone. You can fill that out and we can connect with you virtually anytime during the week. We do want to say a special welcome to everyone who's worshiping with us this morning. And so we also want to be able to extend a hand of Christian fellowship. So as we have all chosen community over isolation, let's stand at this time and extend a socially distant high five or a handshake, whatever you're comfortable with, and let's welcome one another in the name of the Lord this morning. Let's read God's Word together. This comes from 1 John at the end of the chapter, chapter 2, and into chapter 3 as well. Let's read it all together. And now, dear children, continue in Him, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see him as he is. Congregation, please be seated. The choir is going to sing of the character of Christ. Jesus is strong and he is also kind.
Jesus is strong and kind. The psalmist wrote this, that his unfailing love never fails and that we rejoice in the salvation of our God. Let's stand together and sing of that cross where we find our worth. We don't find our worth in things of this world, but what Christ did for us on the cross. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in our hearts and informs everything that we do. We pray that as we study your word this morning, as we open your book, that we would be spoken to straight from your Holy Spirit. God, we ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated.
you would, open with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through 48. Says an argument, friends. I'm so I'm sorry. I'm struggling this morning, friends. I could use your prayers. It says, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child, had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me the one, welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you all, he is the greatest. Lord, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In Luke chapter 9, uh, we find the disciples having had quite a week. They begin the week by Jesus sending them out uh, on their very first mission trip. They go out into the world to, to carry on the ministry of Jesus, and they have great success. So much success that the Bible tells, the, tells us that King Herod thought John the Baptist had risen from the dead. In the rest of the chapter, they experience the feeding of the 5,000. They, they experience the transfiguration and Peter's confession, you are the Christ. It was quite a week for them. There are, of course, a few stumbles. There was the one demon that they could not cast out and Jesus had to step in and save the day. Uh, there was Peter, Peter stumbling on the Mount of Transfiguration where he wanted to build a house and, and he, he so spoke out of place that Luke has to write in parentheses, Peter did not know what he was talking about, basically. Uh, they have, of course, uh, then find themselves in uh, the passage, just before the passage we read today, uh, where they look at one another and as if they have not been paying attention to Jesus at all, ask, who is the greatest? It's easy for us when we're reading through Luke chapter 9 to think these disciples just don't get it. But maybe their conversation started off in, uh, easy enough, innocently enough. Maybe they were trying to figure out who was the best at casting out demons or, or who was the best at healing the sick. Uh, maybe they were wondering who was the best at drawing a crowd. We do this, don't we? We are constantly trying to figure out who is the best at what. I mean, Clint has the choir in green and gold today. I have maroon and white socks on. Uh, we are all hoping to be a part of something or someone who is the best. Maybe they were just uh, filling out their yearbooks. Which disciple was the best dressed, the best looking, the most likely to preach to thousands? Our society is hardly different from that of the disciples. We still uh, want to be the best. We live in a day and age where failure seems to be the greatest sin of all. It's almost a classic now, although I can't recommend it because it's got plenty of parts a preacher shouldn't recommend, but that old movie, Talladega Nights, it tells the story of the NASCAR driver, Ricky Bobby. Remember that? Uh, Allison has, uh, a da her dad's name's Bill, my dad's name's Ricky. We thought about naming one of our kids Ricky Billy, uh, but we didn't, we didn't go with that. Well, Ricky, Bobby's, Ricky Bobby's life motto is, you are either first or you are last. Really, the whole movie is a farce. It's making fun of Ricky's motto, and yet the joke is really on us many times, isn't it? Because that is how we live. Desmond Tutu, who turned 90 this week, uh, who has seen a, a, a world uh, where one group ruled over another. He talks in his book, God Has a Dream. Our culture places a high premium on success, based as it seems to be on unbridled cutthroat competitiveness. You must succeed. It matters little in what you succeed as long as you succeed. The unforgivable sin is to fail. Consequently, it is survival of the fittest and devil take the hindmost. We find that stomach ulcers become a status symbol. He says we infect our children with this virus early. We don't just want them to pass their exams at school and do well at sport. We want them to wipe the floor with the opposition. We make them believe, and this is the problem. It's not that we don't want to do our best, but our culture's perfectionism sometimes makes our children believe that we will only cherish them 
if they do well and behave well. As Tutu points out, we are increasingly becoming a society where it's not enough just to make a living. You have to make the most money of all. It's not enough to just be a good athlete. We think we have to be the perfect athlete or you are no good at all. Just yesterday, Allison and I were catching up with a friend and we've always known her as an adult, as someone who runs marathons and someone who's very athletic, uh, someone who uh, we always thought, man, she, she probably has always been this great athlete. And she talks about how she was on her school's cross country team and she finished almost every race last. But she talks about how she had a coach who understood this young lady is never going to score a point for my team but that's okay. And she, this coach encouraged her and said, running is good for you and you love it. Keep on doing that. And now, well, into her 40s, she's running marathon after marathon, not posting the best times, but still doing something good. But do you know how many kids never get to that point? Because as a culture, we think if you're not on the first place team, what's the point? If you're not first in the race, what's the point? And yet there's so much life to be lived where it isn't, so much life to be lived when we are not first. In our personal life, uh, this kind of struggle to think that life only matters if we are the best takes the form of perfectionism, doesn't it? It's a thought that the only way to be significant in this life is to be perfect and flawless. That's how we think we will stand out. Instagram has made this even worse, right? I mean, we have filters to do what? Uh, Make what is reality look a little bit better. So now it's not only that we compare ourselves to other people, we can compare ourselves to fake versions of other people. How can any of us measure up like that? In, In evangelical circles, our perfectionism can be insidious because we think it's an attempt to try to be like God, but very often what we are doing is really being like Adam and Eve in the garden. We are trying to seize what is not ours. Friends, there is only one perfect being in the universe, and that is God Almighty. We are fallible people. Yet it's so easy, isn't it, to get seduced into our culture's perfectionism, the the idol we make of those who are so good at whatever it is they do. We jokingly sometimes, you go to a golf tournament and somebody, uh, you know, hits an amazing shot and the audience will mock bow, we are not worthy. And yet sometimes we buy into that, right? That a person only has value if they can somehow excel at something above everyone else. I remember a few years ago when the comedian Kathy Griffin won an Emmy. Uh, She outraged sensitive types when she said, a lot of people come up here and thank Jesus for this award, and I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. As she lifted the stage, she lifted the trophy and declared, this award is my God now. Her regard was certainly tasteless, and it was probably blasphemous, She was probably actually speaking the truth. I'm not sure Jesus had a whole lot to do with her award, if you've watched any of her comedy. And I also know that Jesus probably doesn't care about many of our awards. He probably wishes we cared more about one another than the little plastic trophies we sometimes so work so hard to get. It doesn't take awards of gold or silver, does it, for our perfectionism to get the best of it. Now, the very nature of perfectionism can cause us to make an idol of really our, not just our own abilities, but our own perfect environment. If you are a perfectionist and you are wanting to do things on your own and you want them to be perfect, how often do you let other people participate in your life? We talk a lot about community over isolation in our church, and this is part of it. One of the reasons we choose isolation so often is because we don't want other people to mess up what we've got going. I confess that that this is me, okay? That sometimes, especially when I was growing up in school, I I was a perfectionist. I did very well at school. I got straight A's and I didn't just wanna get straight A's, I wanted to get the highest A's. And you know what I hated more than anything else? Group work, right? Because all of a sudden, my grade depended upon someone else, right? But this is an idol of self. It's an idol of of perfection when all the while it, it is this idea that doing it right means doing it perfectly instead of doing it together with someone else. That's really what the disciples are missing out on. 
They are wanting individual success above all other things. Who is the greatest? Jesus hadn't sent them out one by one. He'd sent them out as a group. And even Jesus himself doesn't go alone, does he? I mean, if Jesus wanted a perfect ministry, he could have had it because it could have just been him doing the ministry. But who did he decide? Who did he call to be his his sidekick, so to speak? The disciples who were always messing up. If you think about what it means to have a perfect ministry, we know that Jesus was perfect in all he did. But that doesn't mean his ministry never made mistakes. You know why? Because he included the disciples in his ministry, and they made mistakes all the time. Perfectionism keeps us at arm's length from one another, but grace draws one another in together. Grace recognizes that in this life where God calls us to be in relationship with one another, doing it right has much more to do with doing it together than anything else. Jesus makes this point by hearing that after he hears the disciples arguing by drawing a child unto himself. And he says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For he who is least among you, he is the greatest. Did you get that? Jesus, in drawing this child unto him, puts to death really the idea that you and I have to be perfect in order to be acceptable to God. You know who's not perfect? Little kids. I mean, can you imagine this kid standing here? I I imagine he's not different than the kids in our day and age. He was probably squirming. You know, if he's like my kids when they were little, little, there's boogers smeared across his face. You know, he's got the calic lifting up. I mean, uh, this is not a great business uh, production here. Jesus is drawing a child unto him and says, do you want to know who's greatest in the kingdom? It's someone who welcomes a little child unto him. I don't know if you've ever had children help you with projects. But when children help you with projects, it's not perfect. In fact, some of our most treasured possessions in our life are are drawings and and sculptures and other things that we've kept on, held on to through the years. And if anyone else looks at them, they would say, why in the world have you kept those? We've kept those because these are the things that our children made. And it wasn't about it being perfect. It was about us doing that together. Some of you who know your Bible well may say, well, wait, 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 Taylor. Didn't Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount that we were to be perfect like our heavenly Father in heaven is is perfect? And he did. But when we read it in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, we get that what he was telling us to do was to be perfect in love. We are to love our enemies. We are to pray for those who persecute us. We are to be perfect in love as God is perfect in love. And here's something we all must remember all the time Perfect love is messy. You can't have perfect love without there being moments where you have to forgive one another. You can't have perfect love without there being moments where you have to slow down to make sure those you love can keep up. There, it, there's, you can't be perfect in love without be, being willing to allow all of your perfect plans to fall apart so that you can love one another. I don't know about you, but anytime I'm together with those I love, perfection goes out the window, doesn't it? Because we all don't move at the same pace. We all don't have exactly the same ideas. But if we are going to make a life together, perfect in God's love, we'll have to move not by perfection, but by grace. It's a hard lesson for us to remember It's a hard lesson for us to apply to one another, to show grace to one another, but it's also a hard lesson to remember that God shows us this kind of grace because many of us, myself included, have sometimes struggled with this idea that in order to be acceptable, in order to be loved, we must be I can remember very early in my ministry, Allison and I drove home from, from Waco yesterday. That yesterday was the day we got to go to the football game at Baylor and sit in the president's suite. And, and we were on the way home and we have just lived a lot of our life up and down Highway 6. We spent time in Waco and College Station and Marlin. And so we spent time visiting all the different places we live and, and they all look a lot more run down than I remember them. You know, there were a few of those places that we drove by and I'm like, I can't believe our parents let us live here. This doesn't seem really very safe. 
uh, uh, you know, now seeing it through the eyes of a, a parent instead of uh, an adventurous young couple. As we were driving through, we circled through the parking lot of First Baptist Church, Marlin, Texas. Fresh out of seminary, I went to that church and I was filled with, with the idea that if you just worked hard enough, everything would work out. And you've heard this story before, but I can remember sitting in that pastor's office and weeping. Why? Because I had worked and I had worked and I had worked and there were fewer people uh, there than the week before, mostly because most of what I did in that church was bury people. It was a church filled with senior adults. All the young people had moved away. You, you could do all sorts of outreach programs, but there wasn't any, always there, somebody out there to do outreach with. And Allison, as we drove around, we saw just even, even the handful of good things that were in that city while we lived there, so many of them don't even exist anymore. There's just no people there. And we have to remember in life that there are sometimes things that are well beyond our control so that it, even if we do everything right doesn't always work out the way we want it to. And it's easy if we are caught up in the Ricky Bobby theology of life to think that if we are not first, we're last. We can think that even religiously, that, that even if I have done everything God wants me to do, that somehow if I don't have great success, that I must not be acceptable to God. But the Bible, if we read and pay attention to Jesus' words, says the opposite, doesn't it? Jesus' theology is not if you're not first, you're last. He says what? If you are last, you are first. That who he values are the, the least of these. That, that it's the greatest people of this world that the gospel says will be upended so that those who are the least and the left out and the looked over can be exalted in the kingdom of God. Found great encouragement in those early days of ministry from a little devotional by Robert Lupton. He was an inner city minister in Atlanta. Uh, he did lots of work uh, with all sorts of people. Uh, they did really wonderful work uh, trying to help people develop job skills. In fact, there was a season where they started a pallet manufacturing company right there in their inner city ministry. And part of that was to help people have jobs, but to do job training and all sorts of things. And he says, for a while, it was, it was great. Leases were signed, orders were made, production began. Before long, they were seeing wooden pallets roll off the production line in an area of town where there had been no manufacturing for a long, long time. And then he said, all of a sudden, it began to fall apart. Started with some broken machinery, then a couple of employees lost fingers to saws. Turnover increased in the workforce. They brought in consultants and made changes only to see the problems uh, grow and grow until they had to shut down the plant. Lupton admits he was very embarrassed by the failure. Naturally, in such circumstances, he asked what was wrong. He wondered how they had failed so miserably when he said, My, our motives, our mission, and our plans were all high quality. Did they not hear God's will correctly? So that's a question we ask sometimes when things don't work out perfectly. We think, well, did I somehow miss God's will? His answer has given me great peace through the years. He says, behind the questioning is a subtle heresy that God will prosper any endeavor that is done according to his will. The corollary is that whatever fails was done somehow contrary to his intentions. The error in the assumption is that perfect communion with God assures flawless performance of his will. He says, but neither perfect communion nor flawless performance is possible for human beings. I wanna slow down and say that again because I think this is something we all fall into sometimes. We somehow think that if we can hear God perfectly, that everything we do will be a success by the world's standards. That's, that, right? So sometimes when things don't work out, we think, well, that must not have been God's will. But he says, success, I've learned, has little to do with the performance of God's will. Sometimes we fail because of our own stupidity or short not sightedness, and we learn lessons from our mistakes. Sometimes we fail because someone else's failure or because there was too much rain or too little rain. In all of these cases, there's no corrective lessons to be learned. Success is not an automatic consequence of obedience, and he quotes Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Just because we are righteous doesn't mean we never stumble. Just because we are righteous doesn't mean we never make mistakes. 
Just because we are righteous doesn't mean we live out our lives in this world with utter perfection. Because friends, we don't live our lives flawlessly. We live our lives by God's grace. Which means you and I have to constantly remember God's grace is for us when we mess up. That when we mess up and when we make mistakes, And when things don't go the way we intend for them to go, it's easy for us to think that God is disappointed in us because after all, we spend most of our days with the disciples trying to figure out who is the greatest. We measure that based on awards and numbers and all sorts of other things. Meanwhile, Jesus is pulling a little kid up beside him saying, do you want to know who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? You need to look in the other direction, not in the one who is excelling in all things, but in the one who knows how to receive all things from those who give out of grace. So friends, I pray today, no matter what struggles we're having this week, no matter what challenges, no matter how much of a failure you feel like based on the world's standards, you would know God loves you and he has all the grace you need to be a perfect part of his family today. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we give you such thanks that you are indeed a God of grace. That Lord, we, we don't have to be perfect. We, we can't be perfect. For us to pretend like we are perfect is, is really to, to be liars. That Lord, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Lord, we've all made mistakes. There there are things that aren't sins, but are just things that don't work, that don't go the way we plan, that Lord, we stumble every day and you love us still. That Lord, you are a God whose grace is greater than all of our sins. For this, we give you thanks. We pray this in the perfect name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So come to a time of invitation. Respond to the Lord's leading in your life. For some of you, it may be for the first time receiving God's grace of saying, I I know I'm not perfect, but I want to know that I am loved by God. I'm ready to confess my sins and call Jesus my king. I'd love to visit with you during this next song about how to do just that. Others of you may be looking for a church home where we can gather together and serve God in all of our imperfections because we'll serve him through his grace. We'd love for you to be a part of our fellowship as we do that together. And for each of us, it's an opportunity to bring all of our imperfections to his feet and thank him for his love. Would you stand and respond to the Spirit's leading in your life?
congregation, please be seated. As the deacons and the ushers come forward to take up our offering, together we serve a generous God and we give back generously in return with our offerings and our tithes and also our time and talents. Let's take a look to see what's happening in our church over the next couple of weeks and see some ways we can serve. Good morning, church family. Here are this week's video announcements. We have a new ABF class starting for young couples. Join us on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. in Room 101 as we gather together to fellowship, connect, and study God's Word. The class is led by the Smiths, the Wards, and the Whites. See Pastor Davey for more information. The Women's Ministry is hosting a Fall Fellowship on Friday, October 22nd. You will create your own slate charcuterie board to keep or give as a gift, and then select and assemble specialty foods to go with it. To register, email women at sugarlandbaptist.org or go to the Women's Ministry table in the Trinity Cafe after the worship service. Register soon. The deadline is Wednesday, October 13th, and the cost is $40. Join us for Fall Fun Fest on Sunday, October 24th from 4 to 6 p.m. outdoors on the East Lawn. There will be inflatables, carnival games, candy, train rides, and more. You can also help by bringing individually wrapped candy to the church for prizes or by volunteering for setup and to run carnival games. Do you have a desire to lead worship through singing or playing an instrument? Join us next Sunday in our sanctuary choir and orchestra for a special Christmas rehearsal and meal. Orchestra rehearses at 12.30 p.m. with lunch served before the rehearsal. Choir rehearses at 4 p.m. with dinner served afterward. We are preparing for our upcoming production of A Sugarland Christmas, and now is the perfect time to join or rejoin the choir and orchestra to participate in this beloved Christmas program. That's this week's video announcements. If you haven't already been to a Bible study this morning, we invite you to the 11 o'clock Bible study hour. And guests, there's an information table in the Trinity Cafe. We would love to meet you there after the worship service and answer all of your questions about our church. Now for all of us, have a great week. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Please say a prayer for our student ministry. They're going to be on their way back from a retreat this weekend. We pray that all the things that God has done in the life of our students would take root and bloom in their lives in the days ahead. Uh, we also want to encourage you uh, as you make plans this fall. I, I know today I've heard news of so many of you who are at football games this weekend. And that's a good thing. We're glad we're, numbers are going down and we're able to get out and do those things again. Uh, we would love to just encourage you to think through the fall, especially those of you who are worshiping with us online, about when you'd like to come back uh, and worship with us here face to face. We know it's so important in life uh, to have community that we can see and touch and be a part of in, their, in one another's lives. And we're so grateful for the technology that helps us stay connected uh, when we need that. Uh, but we would also love to see your face. Uh, you'll notice in here, save the date for our fall festival. We've moved that outside this year instead of the gym to help with anxieties about the pandemic. But we are wanting that to be a really big uh, neighborhood outreach. And so we would love for you to go ahead and begin inviting friends to that. Uh, we need lots of candy, uh, but it's a great opportunity for us to meet some folks and be able to, to share with them the love that we've experienced in this place. Uh, so friends, be praying for that event, be praying for our fall. Christmas will be here before we know it. Some great opportunities for us to speak about Christ instead of saying quiet. Friends, let's stand and sing together one more song of worship.
Take up my cross and follow the sun. Let it be my life's refrain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Deny myself, take up my cross and follow the sun. Let's go and share Christ over staying quiet.